So we've covered a number of ways, a number of means uh, to encourage to get um, pupils back to school, to get children back to school. And um, just coming back to this graph, which I have shown and demonstrated uh, during a number of uh, seminars in order to convince a number of pol uh, political decision makers to focus on these uh, means of intervention, i.e. warming. Uh, it's efficient and it's cheap. N and we talk about 50 uh, cents, of, uh, 50 euro cents um, per children, so per child. So this is uh, uh, not a great deal of money. However, this requires coordination with the Ministry of Health because uh, that requires sort of in, in terms of coordinating between the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education. And generally speaking, there's a Ministry of Finance that actually is there to make the final decision. Um, so basically, we try to deliver this um, and encourage this policy. We've set up a, an initiative called uh, uh, Deworming the Earth. And uh, that, that has uh, turned out to be quite a successful initiative. This uh, deworming has become a universal program. Yemen, notably, and other countries have started working on this. And um, uh, a number of countries have followed suit. Uh, so this is no longer an academic source of curiosity, but this is really telling in terms of uh, economic policy but it, it doesn't prevent, you know, uh, countries where uniforms are used to uh, focus on this uh, policy as well. This is efficient. This is cheap. This is feasible, and th this needs to be. To, this requires a focus, and we need to draw attention of uh, political decision makers to on this point in order to uh, deliver these um, programs. So here. We go. We have our uh, child dewormed, healthy at school, back to school without uh, paying any tuition fees and so on. However, um, going and school and attending school is not enough. We're, we're talking about uh, this program in India and its survey. Um, very telling indeed, with 51 percent of uh, pupils unable to read a simple uh, paragraph of text. Uh, could have uh, uh, demonstrated all the data related to uh, the attendance rate and the level of knowledge of um, uh, pupils at school, uh, which is uh, which is particularly worrying. So, uh, also what I was telling you about in terms of funding uniforms, deworming uh, children, uh, encouraging pupils to attend school with uh, free meals. Um, being given, but basically, this all um, encouraged people to attend uh, school. But it's um, th there wasn't any evidence pointing to the fact that um, anything was actually learned as a result of this. So encouraging people to go back to school is good, but not enough to learn to actually do any learning. Um, over and above this, very often parents overestimate what children actually learn at school. <clears throat> so uh, here on the um, uh, x-axis here, you have the level of uh, literacy. So zero, not at all, not even one letter. One is about recognizing this one, uh, a few letters. Two is about recognizing words. Three is about reading paragraph. Four uh, stands for uh, being able to read a simple text. On the y-axis, um, you've got what parents actually think children can do, are capable of doing. So here is about, again, uh, not at all. Next category up is reading uh, letters, then words, then paragraphs. So you've only got 34% of children um, who actually uh, don't know how to read. You've got a very uh, small percentage of uh, parents actually aware of this, 45%, 35%. 5% of um, uh, children who don't know how to read. Um, well, in this category, for instance, parents think that their children are actually able to read, to do any reading. So again, same again. 
uh, only 27% of uh, for children who don't know how to recognize letters, who are unable to recognize any letters. Uh, um, again, 25% of parents um, assume that they are capable of um, working out divisions. So basically, there's a discrepancy between what parents think their children are capable of doing and what children are actually capable of uh, doing at school. So it is important, of course, that these children attend school and therefore parents think and regard school as important um, for their children. It would be uh, cynical and uh, dangerous to think that we should actually rely on uh, what parents know um, in terms of what their children are capable of doing, of learning at school. So all efforts leading to uh, bringing uh, children back to school will actually, uh, well, their effect, their impact will be all the more weaker as uh, uh, if schools actually don't deliver on their promises. So basically improving quality of schools is essential because otherwise there's no point in uh, getting people, uh, pupils to attend schools. And, and when we saw it, when we were talking about Madagascar, in the case of Madagascar for people overestimating the effect of education, when we talk about the actual um, impact of education, you know, parents are reasonable, they understand, uh, they were told that uh, school was useful. Well, when, when they realize what's going to happen when they realize that school is uh, inefficient, uh, this is going to lead to a vast uh, political problem. It would be very difficult to reverse the trend. So it is important to improve the quality of school. This is the next step up um, that we need. We must improve quality of schools. So how can we do this? Well, first, uh, firstly, in an intuitive uh, response. So in, when we talk about, in, 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 you know, uh, first year school uh, for children age four to five, um, you have 80 uh, pupils within the same classroom, no uh, school equipment, materials, no books, no uh, blackboard, no uh, uh, learning or teaching uh, posters or mm, boards, nothing at all. So what can we do? Well, providing more resources in school. Second answer, well, maybe this may, may well be a different answer. Maybe we should change the educational uh, system in order to adapt it to what is actually taught to children in, in order to make it a bit more sensitive, not only to the needs of teaching, uh, the teaching staff, but also uh, more sensitive to the needs of um, uh, actual, the, the actual children. Um, so I'm going to talk about the intuitive response uh, before focusing on the uh, other uh, methods. Well, can we improve quality of uh, education? Um, by uh, doing a, a bit more of the same thing. Um, so it turns out that the, uh, the first generation of uh, experiments uh, have um, assessed the impact of improvement uh, in terms of uh, means uh, available at school. So how, basically, how could we work with NGOs and so on? So we've, we've, we've conducted an initial series of exp experiments uh, that have focused precisely on this particular point, and all these experiments have turned out to be negative. And in particular, uh, this is a, uh, very surprising in it at the time. This was very surprising at the time. First of all, distribution of um, school books uh, in Kenya. Very few school books were made available at the time. So we set up about 10 years ago uh, by Michael Kramer, uh, started about 10 years ago this particular program. And, this is, uh, and basically the conclusion was that the experiment maybe was not successful um, because its basis was not sound. Maybe we should start the experiment again. So the official test uh, deemed uh, poor. Maybe we should rework this. We worked with teams to develop more sensitive um, assessments. So uh, nothing positive really came out of it. Well, there is one except for one effect that was uh, 
uh, quite important for uh, the uh, children involved. So it was a bit of a shock there. Uh, secondly, we set up uh, teaching posters in a classroom. Uh, imp and improved the uh, um, p number of pupils per teacher uh, ratio. So this has been tried in a number of contexts in India, in rural India, by Michael Kramer and Abhichi Banerjee, in urban India, and was part of this particular team, and in Kenya. And no effect was actually shown. We, we can actually cut down from 80 to 40 uh, pupils in the same classroom without any uh, having any particular effect. Quite surprising, indeed. Quite surprising. Quite a bit depressing, uh, maybe. But because we we were not uh, pessimistic, uh, we um, we continued with our effort. So how could we explain these negative results? Well, one clues pointed to, and the, the, well, this school books. Uh, I mean, what we realized when we looked into these uh, uh, the data related to school books is that the uh, positive effect of uh, school books, well, they were there, but for children who were um, performing well before the school books were actually handed out. So basically, we was, we had a text, uh, a test, and comparing um, progress of children before and after implementation of school books, and we couldn't see any difference between the uh, test, the uh, controlled group and the, the whole group. And we, if we focused on the top 10 percent, um, um, then we um, observed significant results, significant improvements. So basically, the school books are not there to help the average kids, but they help, they're here to help and support uh, the best performing, the brightest pupils. And when we um, I mean, when we go into a classroom in Kenya, for instance, we can see that this, uh, these are large classrooms, uh, very popular. Uh, obviously, this is part of the positive effect of school for all policy. And this is great. We have so many kids at school. And we have uneducated parents as well as educated parents involved. Um, so these are the kids belonging to the first generation of kids going to school. And in Kenya, English is the third language, the first language being the local language. The second language is the Swahili. And the third language is uh, English and the um, teaching language from um, the uh, second and uh, third year at school is English. So this is a teaching language at school. So, and uh, basically, we then need to realize that most kids um, later on do not are not able to speak English. So basically, this was uh, this was a bit of a concern in terms of the actual uh, curriculum, uh, school curriculum. So it was a case in Kenya and it's a case in many countries, and in particular in many uh, former colonies. This school. Our curriculums are um, old-fashioned and very often the, the heritage of colonial programs where school uh, was used to uh, uh, train, educate um, the local elite um, inherited from the colonial power. It was the model of uh, um, education in back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, before these countries were actually independent or granted their independence. It was true uh, at the time where school um, was reserved to an elite. And this was you know, about training the civil servants of the new uh, independent republic. So that's what happened after colony, um, these colonies were granted their independence. And then, uh, basically, the situation in these countries has changed, but, uh, n but n that is not, that hasn't been the case in, um, in the way that curriculum have been developed. So just to give you an example, the way that a teacher when I visit a school, uh, generally speaking, a teacher on that particular day wants to impress me. And the way um, this is, is done is about filling the blackboard with extremely complex equation so that the, the teacher can actually um, has a sort of a mastery com uh, skills on specific uh, materials. Um, and then, the, bearing in mind, the whole classroom doesn't know what's happening, basically. Um, so there's a big sort of gap between what is, is, is being taught and the actual needs. Secondly, um, teachers lack motivation. 
a sign of that, a very clear sign of that, is that absenteeism among teachers is a、um, widespread. And this is the first column here. This is、uh, primary school absenteeism in across different countries. Fourteen、uh, percent in Kuwait, sixteen percent in Bangladesh, twenty-five、uh, percent in India, ninety、uh, percent in Indonesia, eleven percent in Peru, and twenty-seven percent in Uganda.、Um, so the Very often absent, and、uh, when they are actually there on site, don't necessarily teach anything. So, and when we carried out an announced、uh, visit, this is what we observed, and we, we, we could actually see what the actual teachers were doing. Secondly, what can be observed is that a number of teachers present at school do not necessarily teach. So, for instance, in India, for instance, a quarter of、uh, Um, teachers are absent, and half of these、uh, teachers actually there on site do not actually do any teaching. So,、um, uh, and results are exactly the same for uh, other countries. Uh, in other countries, so absenteeism is in an issue. And I wanted to comment on a first. Study that tried to tackle、um, at, uh, both at the same time the, the issue of the curriculum and, in particular, the uh, adaptation uh, and the sensitivity of programs for and curriculums for new teachers and motivation. The study has been carried out in two Indian cities, in Baroda and in Bombay, and was part of this team, this project team, with a few、um, colleagues with、uh, Banerjee、uh, and Nilden. And this is part of the uh, uh, Pratham, this、uh, dealing with the ASA report, and the、um, program is as follows: two for two hours a day, the young. Woman, the Balsakida、um, uh, children's friend, as it's called,、uh, works with the pupils、uh, that have reached the、um, uh, third or fourth and fifth year at primary school, so level three and four. And Pratham has come to. Well, they, they 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 came to us and they asked whether we wanted to be involved in the assessment of the program. They said that there was no program、uh, being rolled out in Baroda, so quite an average city. They, they we were told that they had programs in Bombay, but they but not in the L、um, district of the city. So we basically they said, well, we have we've got enough money to um, um, to involve one Balsaki per school.、Uh, would you like to assess the program? So this is how we did it. So basically, we did, there was a distribution with all the cities in the cities.、Uh, this pattern is the same in, in Bombay as well. So we've distributed、um, this school into two groups: Group A and Group B. The Balsaki was going to uh, uh, to, to visit、uh, the second year at primary schools, and in Group B. So basically, we've got a program in every school. We've got、um, we've used. All the allocated resources, and then we can、um, compare and contrast the level of、uh, second and third year pupils in Group A and、uh, Group B, so Grade Three and Four. So with a program and in comparison, so where the、uh, program is actually、uh, being implemented, this is just a randomised pattern in the way we've operated our.、Uh, Uh, assessment, but this wouldn't actually work、uh, in the case of reallocation of resources. But in India, as in France, resources are quite well set、uh, and fixed、um, for on a per classroom level. So we can regard these groups are as independent. So let's check out the results here. So this is a graphic illustration of this. This is for subtraction. Uh, I.e., the number of kids、uh, able to actually carry out subtractions at the beginning of the year. So this is amongst the weakest part of,、um, or least performing part of、um, uh, pupils. And at the end of this, so、uh, we, we've got 61 percent for kids、uh, who've benefited from the services of Balzaki, who've been supported by Balzaki. And the second group, we reached 50 percent. So we've got a 10 percent、uh, difference.、Um, 
in terms of people being uh, pupils being able to carry out subtractions, and this has been rolled out and extended to reading, literacy program, uh, other types of calculation, and so on. So, next question is about how could we express these results in a more systematic way? So, here I would like to. Uh, this is a sort of side. Um, I, w I would like to explain and clarify a few uh, technical bits. So how the, are these results standardized through, throughout the first part of this um, um, course, this program, we've compared a number of, a different, a number of different types of interventions in order to encourage kids to go back to school. Um, for uh, marks, uh, the um, exam marks. The problem is that every exam is different. For instance, in France, we grade between 0 and 20. In, in America, it's between A, B, C, and D. In other countries, um, these results can be expressed differently. How can we compare and contrast this using a single scale? And the way we did it is that we've standardized marks. <clears throat> so we take the results of uh, I, uh, um, pupil minus the average for the control groups in the baseline divided by the um, uh, d uh, standard deviation. And uh, this is between express between 0 and 1. Sorry, the, this gives us a measure. It can be uh, minus something or plus something, and the average is 0, and the standard deviation is 1. So all the intervention can then be compared. They are expressed in standard deviation. Uh, this is an, an advantage. This is a point of the exercise. Uh, furthermore, if the distribution of tests and the scoring is a standard, this allows us this allow us to think of this uh, in terms of the position amongst the distribution. So the uh, standard deviation effect, for instance, is like if we take a, a pupils belonging to the 25th percent and uh, using this as a median pupil. Just all the results, as from now, all the uh, results will be expressed in terms of uh, delta, in terms of standard deviation. 10 percent of a standard deviation is considered as a positive yet low level. 20% is a significant effect and 30% is a major impact. So you can keep those figures in mind. So, remember, 30% means a lot. So here, the Balzaki pro program had a 30% standard deviation impact on average. And if we focus on the uh, uh, more illiterate children, it had a 60% improvement rate. And positive effects are focusing on those children having most problem and who attended these support classes. And if you have 60 pupils in a classroom, the Balzaki would take the 20 kids having most difficulties and work with them independently. So that show, that's another example that shows that what needs to be done is adapting the teaching method. That was in the urban areas of India. Then we also assessed another Pratam program for rural India, and that was about reading uh, ability. And this is, these results are easier to assess because we can focus on what children can read. Can they read letters? words, paragraphs, uh, an entire story. So we started with kids who couldn't read at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, those who attended the Red Read India uh, classes could read letters. So we moved from zero to 100% for those who attended uh, class. So that's also because children are a bit older, they learn s things in schools, but as compared to the control group, you see the difference between 40% and 100%. But those who started from scratch learnt the letters but still can't read a paragraph and still can't read the whole story. So I've not shown you the graphs, but for those children who can read 
who could read uh, letters already, 100% of them could read a paragraph at the end of the year. And likewise, for those who could read paragraphs at the beginning of the year, 100% of them could read a whole story at the end. So how can we interpret these results now? Well, there are two different things which occur in this uh, in these programs, like the Balzaki program or the Read India program. Uh, we're doing two things at the same time. One, there is the recruitment of a young, highly motivated uh, lady who really wants children to succeed. So we have a group of highly motivated people who want to work with children, and their mission is changed. So the, the, the job of the teacher is to teach the program even if children are left behind. But the Balzaki's job is to make sure that children who can't read learn how to read. So we change two things at the same time. We modified motivation, and we modified the definition of teaching methodology. So we know that this program has a useful impact, that's one thing, but with regards to knowledge, we've not learned enough from these programs to come up with a policy recommendation because if motivation was important, then we could try and motivate teacher, or if it was a teaching method that was important, we could teach the method to teachers. So it would be good to be able to discriminate between these two factors. So in order to discriminate between, between these two factors and to see if these results could be duplicated to other contexts, we went to Kenya. And we implemented an experiment to try and discriminate and to focus on each of these aspects separately. So that's the so-called one additional teacher program because it consists in providing an additional teacher to schools. So because school is free in Kenya, there is a very large number of children per classroom, 80 on average uh, for kids aged from 6 to 10. And the government doesn't have sufficient budget to recruit new teachers. And the problem is there are many unemployed teachers and uh, very dense classrooms. In the past, schools uh, asked parents to contribute financially to be able to recruit an additional teacher locally. Today, schools cannot do that because this has become illegal. So they have the financial means to do that, but they are not allowed to do it. They could do that, but uh, they no longer have the uh, subsidies from the government. So what we did was to go to the World Bank and convince the World Bank to uh, provide fundings to the uh, school board so that the school board could hire additional teachers, among those teachers who are qualified teachers but unemployed teachers. And the idea was to have these additional teachers to work with six-year-olds so that the group would be reduced from 80 children in the classroom to 40. So the schools recruited perfectly qualified, young, experienced teachers with a one-year contract that could be renewed if the schools were happy with the teachers. We had a budget for two years for each school. That was the basic program. What we could have done was to, because we managed to get a budget for 140 school that we selected randomly, and we could have been happy with just doing that. But what we did in cooperation with the schools was to try and understand how we could best use these, uh, these additional resources. So here is the experimental uh, setting. We have two groups, one group that doesn't benefit from an additional teacher and the group that benefits from an extra teacher. For those receiving an extra teacher, we separated this group into two subgroups. Uh, one group with uh, level tracking and another one with no level tracking. When you have one class of 80 children, you can do that in different ways. Either you 
just spread the kids uh, randomly and you have heterogeneous groups or else you use the results of the first quarter and see their level at the end of the first quarter and those having the lowest results you put them in, a, in one class and you put the uh, those having the best results in, a, in another group so that's what we call level tracking so that's another that's another distinction that we made in our experiment, and that's a way to learn things about the teaching method. Now, the second question we can ask ourselves is the issue of motivation. Is it possible to compare the performances of a young and highly motivated uh, teacher working on a one-year contract who want to be hired again to those of a standard regular teacher. So the way we did that is as follows. Once the groups were designed, the um, uh, teachers uh, tossed a coin to decide which group they would teach. So we have, once again, two different groups. Uh, you have, for those with level tracking or no level tracking, and then you have with uh, teachers allocated randomly either the traditional teacher or the additional teacher. So that gives us perfectly comparable groups. By doing things this way, we learn more on the impact of reducing the number of children per classroom. So what are the results? If we want to know the impact of level tracking, we can compare all these children to all these children. If we want to learn about the impact of the new teacher as compared to the regular teacher, we can compare these kids to those kids. And then you can even compare within one block to see if it's the uh, uh, number of children that have the largest impact as compared to the fact of having a new teacher or a regular teacher. So for one type of teacher and for one type of classroom, the results increase by 14% of a standard deviation in schools having uh, level tracking. What's important is that this is an effect that we observe for both bright children and those having more difficulties. Because we could have uh, intuitively said or thought that maybe this system is going to be valid for the brighter students, but not that good for other children who were all put together having many difficulties. But here we see that the impact is just as important for uh, children who had the greatest difficulties at the beginning. So it is a matter of teaching method and of heterogeneity of the classroom. And then we can observe what the teachers do in the classroom. And we can do that by observing their teaching methods. So we sit in the classroom and look at what the teacher does with the children. And we can also do that by assessing the progress of children. And we see that for the weakest children, this uh, level tracking initiative really helped them uh, master a basic uh, knowledge and skills. Second thing, new teachers being young and motivated but having less experience. Now we've defined the organization and the size of the classroom. But the results achieved by students studying with the extra teacher are 18% of a standard deviation higher than those working with a standard teacher. This conclusion can be misleading because the reason why these extra teachers are highly motivated is because they hope to, be, to see their contracts renewed. So we cannot conclude from this that all standard teachers should be replaced. But what we can learn, and 
What we can learn is that it shows that motivation has an impact. So it shows it's important. We need and identify means to encourage and motivate regular teachers. So now, now that we've realized it's important to motivate teachers, how can we achieve that? One program that, which is quite popular today, whether in the US or in developing countries, consists in giving bonuses to teachers based on their students' results. And just to show you, this is a policy which is very much uh, implemented in the US the uh, No Child Left Behind program, which is uh, George Bush's uh, educational reform, does not offer bonuses but offers neg but provides negative bonuses. So uh, there is a penalty on teachers when the results are not of the expectations. And I see this policy is not very popular amongst you in the audience, but this is a very popular policy throughout the world. And the results are quite mixed or even negative with regards to the impact of these policies. So there are two studies which have been carried out, one in Kenya, the other one in India, and they both have very similar types of results. They assessed programs which, which give teachers a bonus if their students achieve better results than those in another school in the same district. So it's kind of a competition at district level. In the first experiment carried out in Kenya, the results show that on the short term, it's positive and the uh, success level is higher. But these results are not sustainable. And if the bonus is removed the following year, all the benefits disappear. And by the way, I need to tell you that the other programs uh, have, that I just told you about, have a sustainable impact. Once children have learned something, they retain it and they can use it the next year, the following year. For instance, uh, children who benefited the uh, program at the age of six and seven learned additional things that they could use when they were eight, nine, and ten. So these the uh, measure can be regarded as efficient when its efficacy lasts on the long term because it's, it strengthens the abilities and capacities of children. These experiments were not sustainable on the long term, and when you look into the details, you see that teachers have used a certain number of tricks to improve the uh, uh, results of the exam. For instance, they uh, told the students that they should always answer a question because there was uh, a penalty if you don't answer a question. They also organized uh, uh, training sessions, etc. In India, there, another experiment was carried out, and uh, many studies also were carried out in the United States showing that these manipulations are very frequent, ranging from better feeding children the day of the exam to something which is quite widespread, which consists in saying that children are special education, that means that they have special needs, and they're too weak and they can't take the exam. And that has a real impact on children because then they have to change school and go to special education class. And this can have a very damaging effect. So all this means that bonuses based on the performance of teachers uh, provide a very mixed results. Another thing which can be done in developing countries for which we've seen that health is so important 
could be to start from the basis and to tell teachers that their job consists in coming to school. This is not a problem we face in our country, so that's not a lever in our developed countries, but that's clearly a lever of action in countries like India. So we said, well, let's try that in uh, Rajasthan. And we worked with schools uh, run by an NGO, and there was no headmaster who could make sure that Uh, the school teachers were present. That's in Rajasthan, almost in the middle of the desert. Everything's very far away, and it's difficult for uh, the NGO to visit the school on a regular basis. So before we implemented the program, the uh, absenteeism level for teachers was at 40%. So when you have 40% teachers not coming to school and 40% children coming to school when the school was actually open, you see that there is a great margin of improvement. So with the NGO, we started thinking on how we could uh, make these teachers more responsible for coming to school. So they provided them with cameras, and they asked them to take pictures. This is a small school that gives you an idea of the environment. So that's a classroom. These are the children. Here is the teacher, and that's the date and the hour. So that's the 8th, and it's almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So teachers had to take a picture of themselves and of the children in the morning and in the afternoon, and then they were paid with bonuses based on the number of days they were present in school. So they had the, they had the basic salary, and they were paid more per day of presence in school. So I'll show you the result on the uh, absenteeism of both children uh, of teachers, sorry, so that's uh, the, the uh, blue line, the light blue line is the tested group, and the dark blue line is the control group. So you see the basis and the progression. So we reduced absenteeism that moves from 40% to 20%. And that's quite significant. We were a bit worried about the way teachers would react initially, but it turned out teachers were very happy because they all of a sudden realized that they could con take control of their life, they could work more, earn more money, and more particularly, they could refuse because, you know, teachers are sometimes the only person, educated person, who can read and write in the village. So the teacher is used by the entire village and carries out a series of mission for the village. And it's difficult for them to refuse to do that. And now he could answer, no, sorry, that my job is to teach in school, and I have to go to school. So now, if this additional did this additional presence translate into better results on the students' side? Because that's the important question. If teachers come more, but children don't learn more, is it, it's not really worth it. So this is a, a study in which we have the results in terms of standard deviation for math, 15% of a standard deviation. And between brackets, you have the standard deviation of the result to give you an idea of its accuracy. So if you divide 0.15 by 0.07, and it's above 2, uh, it means that the result is positive. So you see that that we get 15% of a standard deviation for math, 16% of a standard deviation for language, uh, that was for mid-test, and for the uh, second test, uh, the results were even more significant. 
So this program was not aimed at being disseminated any further. It was just aiming at demonstrating, well, it was useful for the NGO, which still uses it, but we knew that it would be impossible to have it implemented in an entire educational system. And when this type of program was tested in regular primary schools, we rapidly saw that the program was no longer uh, adopted or enforced. So what we learn from this program is not, we need to put cameras in the schools, but we need to find a means to motivate teachers. And one way of doing that is to change the programs. Because as we saw in the program that consisted in putting in a, an extra teacher in schools, when a classroom only have one, when you have only children of the same age group in one classroom, it's more motivating and teachers come to school more often and that has a direct impact on students. But beyond that, how can we reform the educational system so that this system motivates teachers? I think it's important to understand that the uh, program I've just talked about is a program that can be applied in terms or translated into policies. It just shows that motivation is, a, motivation is an important factor. So the question is, what can we do in terms of an educational system in order to motivate teachers? So one answer that can be found and that has almost become a new uh, uh, wisdom, conventional wisdom, is about giving, empowering uh, parents, giving more power to parents in terms of empowering beneficiaries. This is what we call this um, this way. So basically, this is about, you know, giving more power to parents located near the school itself. And then really, this is about encouraging them to <clears throat> have an interest in, in a school itself. So this is about um, maybe for them to supervise uh, teachers, making sure that they are going to actually attend school and deliver their classes. So this program started back in 2004, and that this has become a uh, recommendation, a, a guideline itself. So what can we see? Can this be successful? This has been widely adopted by Sikska uh, Sava Avian in India. This was about in developing resources um, for education. This is about education for children. This the, the actual translation. This is how more or less this um, three terms could be translated. So in this SSA program, um, actually translate, there's obviously the um, obligation for all schools to set up um, supervisory school committees, so what we call village supervisory committees, where parents can have an, um, an influence on a control over the school in terms of funding and also in terms of the possibility to recruit more teachers, um, basically based on similar types of programs as we've previously discussed. So these programs are um, um, have been implemented a bit everywhere. The, the penetration rate has not been um, great, but this is the um, um, results observed in Andhra Pradesh, one of the most uh, or highly populated uh, region in India. Um, and basically, it was about uh, asking the following question. Have you heard of the uh, school supervisory committee? And you can see that 92% of villagers, of um, pupils, parents, are actually not aware that there is a school committee. So uh, uh, only 7% of people who actually had heard of this. And out of this, 
uh, only 1%, who was actually a member of these committees, even more serious, more, most members of the supervisory committees are not aware that they are members of the committees. So this was really uh, a, a dead duck, so to speak. So uh, basically, Pratam tried to um, you know, give a new life to these programs. This was about you know, make sure that parents would be aware that they would actually, and that teachers would be aware that the, these uh, structures uh, existed. So the Pratam launched um, a communication campaign starting off with a series of meetings, local meetings with a more sort of a, a bigger meeting when we performance of uh, children would be discussed with an action plan for the school uh, would be addressed and so on. So I talked about uh, Red India uh, program. It was in the same context, i.e. in the villages. They based, uh, they, they really um, based their program on this to um, um, f develop the Red India program. So the program has been quite useful in terms of mobilizing uh, parents when it was a uh, clear um, direction given to this. So basically we mobilized volunteers um, without, however, any uh, other mm, directions, uh, not in terms of future uh, curriculum, not in terms of the parents' involvement. So basically, in terms of developing village um, supervisory committee for schools, although they are supervised by um, uh, parents themselves, well, this hasn't had any particular impact. Uh, quite disappointing there. But in other contexts, there has been a series of success uh, stories. And uh, one of the groups I did not tackle when we, we was talking about the village uh, related projects. That the, in one group, you compare, well, uh, an NGO visited the school to explain how resources could be better used. And in these uh, um, schools, well, results were much better in terms of uh, kids, pupils being involved, and teachers, uh, as well as parents being involved. So, uh, and other types of initiatives have been quite successful as well, programmed to what we call uh, switchboard um, uh, programs. Uh, basically, this a switchboard, a kind of series of parameters is prepared at the beginning of the year for parents and children. This is then being discussed at school, in the school context. So at the moment, we don't, we're not really aware in what type of context this approach can work or cannot work. Um, now, another type of action that can be taken, well, the World Bank uh, has been um, putting this forward uh, often. This is about privatization. Uh, a public funding of education does not necessarily in, imply that um, uh, all the services are uh, public, only public. In uh, some countries, a number of private, uh, well, uh, pupils get a voucher to pay for private um, education. So this policy has been uh, often put forward, and in France we're not that far away from these policies because private schools under contract uh, get funding depending on the number of pupils they get. In France, the, our system, as a matter of fact, looks like, well, qu 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 it's quite like that of Venezuela. As an example, up to a certain level, a funding is put forward, is made available. Um, uh, from public funds. So what is the impact of all this? Well, uh, we've got, uh, we have carried out surveys that uh, involved what we call partial equilibrium. So this program is uh, uh, very often there are uh, rolled out on uh, small scales. Uh, so basically the government uh, allocates a number of um, um, places, number of um, uh, Positions and then we can compare uh, results, not for assessment purposes, but once this is done, we can compare uh, uh, the results for uh, between pupils who benefited from these programs and those who uh, have not. 
So basically, this is about providing more opportunities for children to get private education. Results are better. Uh, not only at the beginning, but also at the end of their schooling, uh, um, greater number of them can uh, complete their secondary school education. In Colombia, for instance, we have served that a number of uh, kids were not able to complete their um, secondary school educations, um, and uh, they also get better results at a level. Mm. Um, then uh, pupils who, um, get uh, the uh, lottery, well, these results do, are not really telling in terms of what the effect or, or the influence of uh, a voucher-based system. The reason for this is that in, in the case of a lottery, we keep the system as it is, the whole system, and we just shift one pupil from one place to another. And if we were going to generalize this lottery system, there would be an effect on the public offer. Um, this would de deteriorate because kids may be, I mean, there may be some kind of improvement because of uh, accrued c competition. But potentially, it would be quite wearing moving in terms of moving from the partial equilibrium to general equilibrium. General equilibrium is what happens in the general markets when we change the uh, rules uh, pertaining to specific markets. So then we, can, we could compare, we would need to compare um, general um, systems where um, vouchers are uh, widespread to a system where they're not. So well, at the moment, we cannot, we haven't been able to carry out any such comparisons. In India, we've had an initiative that uh, has aimed at de developing this analysis at the level of villages. Now, what can we say is that in some countries where there's no uh, voucher related systems where pupils are, you know, it's up to them to actually decide and to cover all the costs for private education. Well, in some countries, there's a partial privatization that actually uh, is there uh, de facto in Mashra, Dar Pradesh, in uh, great Indian regions, more than 50% of children are actually privately educated. So this has been a um, response to the actual state of public schools that has been regarded by many parents, even amongst the poor parents, as insufficient. And this is a completely deregulated offer um, in terms of education, and that hasn't been uh, controlled. Now, uh, in, in other countries like Pakistan, where one-third of pupils have already been schooled in a private uh, system, and this, is, this uh, actually holds true um, in, in different countries. So when in some of the uh, great and large uh, Indian regions, more privately educated kids than others, like in Venezuela, for instance, or in Chile. So uh, where this is we are supposed to have like a total privately uh, um, education related systems. So in a voucher system or in a support system, in direct support, as we have in, in France, uh, for privately, uh, private education, it would be more about a redistribution program uh, in terms of uh, um, renting money, funding poorer families if this program with sort of small uh, tuition fees and maybe with a sort of a, a proportion system uh, for poorer families, for supporting poorer families, uh, to um, uh, in order for their kids to uh, enjoy private education. So we, we, we should actually think about these systems in this particular context. Secondly, in a context like um, that of uh, India or Pakistan, where school is largely priv um, private and has been largely privatized, it is important to um, to give parents uh, information that could enable them to um, end up with the right choice for their pup uh, their children. We've seen that for education. We've, we'll see this again. And this will hold true for health next, and we'll cover that next week. The private sector is completely deregulated as opposed to what uh, what happens in a system like France when you have to be, when if you want to be under contract, you need to um, meet a number of requirements and for private schools, anyone can actually decide, anyone uh, can decide to set up um, a private school. 
and many data has pointed to the fact that parents find it difficult to assess the quality of a school. And one of the reasons why this is tricky uh, is that the, the quality of a school is, well, it's not necessarily reflected by the average test um, because this is more a reflection uh, in relation to the, who, um, the actual demographics attending schools. Um, as opposed to the actual quality of school. So this is def difficult to distinguish uh, based on the uh, data available uh, in relation to the quality of school. So for parents, it's difficult to come up with the right choices, with suitable choices or adequate choices in terms of you know, putting pressure on schools in order for them to deliver the right quality of education and to improve their quality of education. In this context, in this widely privatized context like this one, it is... Um, would be useful to provide parents with more information related to um, uh, success uh, school. So this has been known for Pakistan, where you have about 12 schools uh, in, in, in one village. What researchers have done is that they've, they, they've visited schools, they, they got lots, uh, collected lots of information, lots of data from the general information related uh, data to uh, cl um, cohort sizes, to actual results, exam results. And this has been quite useful because the immediate actions from the parents' uh, standpoint is that they, they could come and threaten the schools um, and, and, and um, put pressure on schools for school, the schools to improve it, the quality of its education. This has allowed to cut down um, private um, schools' tuition fees, um, stimulated competition, and um, besides, it has allowed to push uh, upwards the uh, results. When, um, significantly so basically many pupils have changed schools and firstly and secondly parents have actually put pressure on schools to improve their quality of the quality of the teaching so basically in terms of um, in policies i.e. Um, when we raise the issue well could should we privatize schools well Maybe we could say that um, how, given the current systems, how could we accompany, how could we support parents in a highly diversified offer? Um, this really points to the absolute necessity of regulating uh, the private sectors in developing countries. So as a conclusion, I think that we, today we better understand more so than 10 years back that uh, what um, you know? What um, impacts? What uh, triggers reactions uh, from the parents' uh, standpoint, from the uh, children's standpoint, and from teachers' uh, standpoint? This is more about redistribution policy than educational policy. Uh, parents will send schools, uh, their children, to schools. Anyway, it is therefore essential to improve the quality of education so that parents uh, don't get discouraged. This is more from the parents' side. Teachers need uh, more motivating uh, school curriculums. They're faced they're faced with a, a mission that in, uh, they're not humanly possible to deliver. Uh, we cannot teach nuclear physics to pupils who haven't really grasped uh, reading literacy. Um, in this particular context today, and pr putting forward um, incentives, uh, i.e. for teachers in order to encourage them to attend schools and deliver their classes, we need to find some ways to do that at the level of the systems, and we have fewer information on that particular point. Changing um, school curriculums is, is, is something that uh, can, be, uh, can be done today. As far as children's, uh, children are concerned, they need to have a motivation to attend school. And very often we've seen that part of their absence uh, can be explained by diseases, a small part by the fact that they the help um, at home and a, a significant part as well can be explained that very often they're abscond from schools that don't actually attend school. And uh, when they, they play cricket in the street, when we ask them, well, why not to school? Well, the standard re reply is, uh, well, they get bored and they don't understand, they don't have a clue what's happening. 
So we need to uh, develop curriculum that actually meet their uh, needs, and no doubt, and this, you know, we we need to uh, school needs to be a place where that is more enjoyable, and in many countries, in former colonies, I mean, in schools can. Uh, are associated to kind of strict environments where there's no uh, recreational space, no time for sporting activities, no uh, football, um, and so maybe we should we could uh, look into this in further uh, forthcoming projects. Maybe making school fun. Uh, in order to stimulate education, so maybe we've we've made step for, steps forward in, in that matter. What we this is what we can understand quite clearly. What we don't really understand that clearly is that we need to put forward a system that brings together all these ingredients, all these elements, and this is more about political, economic related. Uh, issue as opposed to, um, um, you know, the kind of education only policy. This is an open question, and we need to actually uh, um, improve our thinking in this uh, matters. Thank you very much indeed.